and any order of reference that it has received. It is nothing more than a fishing expedition from a desperate group of people who cannot see past their own narrow partisan self-interest long enough to see that Canadians are suffering and need all of us focused on supporting them through this time. Conservatives, Madam Chair, in my opinion, need to ask themselves some pretty basic questions. Do their actions pass the reasonability uh, the, the reasonableness test is is what they are trying to proportionate and responsible and responsible is proportionate responsible during a pandemic and are they going to focus on Canadians or are they going to keep focusing on narrow partisan interests I think they know the answers to these questions and I think Canadians will judge them on how they behaved at a time when what is needed is leadership and constructive cooperation between parties. We, what we are seeing here is overtly divisive partisanship that simply looks to score political points. This approach not only undermines public trust in our institutions, but undermines public trust in us as political representatives of the people we are elected to serve. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Chair. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, next on the speakers list, we have Ms. Vecchio and then we have Mr. Tucker. Thank you very much, and, and, and I, I really appreciate Mark's comments, but I think public trust is what was lost on August 18th in the first place. So I think if we're going to use those lines, we should reflect on the government's actions prior to that. So uh, let's not talk about public trust as though we've lost it fully, especially on the Conservative side. I can tell you back in the writing of Elgin Middlesex London that this motion put forward that I had people calling me saying, thank you. We need to hold this government to account. So I think it's perhaps they're not calling you in Kingston, but I can tell you the constituents in Elgin Middlesex London are, bra are, are, are saying bravo. We need to hold them to account. Uh, a couple of things that we were talking about. First of all, the mandate of this committee. We, un we understand that under Standing Order 32-7 that this will be coming to the governor, will be coming to the Procedures and House Affairs Committee. And, and as he indicated, in some committees, people will do um, a little pre-study. Now, that is, a lot of times that may be moot if this is voted on and doesn't come to Procedures and House Affairs. But this will not be voted on. We know that this this will be referred to our committee. It, it's, it's not voted on in the House of Commons. It is automatically sent to us as Procedures and House Affairs. So there's not a vote to say that our pre-study is going to be a waste of time. It's, it's actually, when we're talking about documents, well, these are documents that were requested, as I recall, back in July. So I, I understand, and not, neither would I want to put anyone at risk. But let's, let's not kid ourselves. They've been working on these documents since the 1st of July when they were requested, and now we're actually into October. Um, looking at what the paralyzing of government, um, I, terrible choice of words, because perhaps it was paralyzing of parliament, because that is exactly what this government did with prorogation on August 18th. It's fine to say that the government will not be able to do any work because we'll be paralyzing this committee, but I'm going to remind the honorable member that 338 members of parliament were paralyzed on the 18th of August due to the prorogation in the first place. Uh, with all of these things, I understand it took eight days. I understand it was very complex, this motion, but we do know that it would be coming to this, this committee. We are expecting lots of documents because that is what we've asked for, because prorogation in the middle of a pandemic was absolutely not in the best interest of Canadians. And we saw that last week as we voted at 2.30 in the morning because we need to have Bill C-2 and C-4 pass because we know that all of the programs had stopped the weekend before. There is a gap in these programs. People will be able to apply on October 11th for these programs. So I find it very rich of this member to think that we've paralyzed. The only one who paralyzed the government was the Prime Minister and, and, and his staff. So I'm very concerned with this. When we're looking at this, all we're asking is to be able to pre-study the information that will be coming to our committee anyway.
I'm also going to remind the only way that we're not going to be debating this is if the government decides to prorogue before October 28th. So really, at the end of the day, it's either coming to us or it's not. And it seems like you're just trying to um, say no to the inevitable. It's going to happen. And the fact is, if in, on August 17th and 18th, if you asked Canadians, why do you think the government prorogued? I will tell you that in my writing, I had maybe one person who did not think that it was over some of these issues that we have brought up and to do with the we scandal. We know that through finance and ethics and languages that there were lots of issues that were coming up because of we. And at that time, with the pressure and the heat that was happening in the PMO, that is why government was shut down. I shouldn't say that is why. Maybe prove me elsewise. I, I shouldn't say that because obviously some members of the government believes that was not the case, that the prorogation happened because they are resetting. But we're, I'm, gonna, I'm laughing because we're coming back to Bill C-6, Bill C-4. We're coming back to a bunch of bills that were actually on the table and actually being uh, going to start to being debated. There is nothing new from this reset. We are coming back to medically assistance and dying. We're coming back to conversion therapy. We are coming back to things that the government had already pre-tabled in the 43rd Parliament first session. And we are actually rehashing what happened in in the first session of this parliament there is nothing new so perhaps if the member can share to me that we actually had a reset we actually did a 180 um that's not what happened we are just starting with the same old same old and by closing the door on august the 18th to the parliamentary committees asking these tough questions the government was able to have a break and hope that canadians had a break and would move forward. I recognize that putting members at risk uh, when it comes to staff, none of us want to do that. And that is not the plan. Because also we know that they've been working on these for three months. So let's not use that. And, and the cost produced. It's the first time I've ever heard the government say the cost to produce. We're asking to produce documents on a billion dollar program that was announced. A billion dollars. So uh, don't talk like this is nickel and dimes because we're talking about big dollars here that this government was wasting and being held accountable is exactly what should happen. I appreciate that this member thinks that this is out of order, but at the same day, at the same time, according to Section 32.7, it is the mandate of this committee when it comes to procedures in the House Affairs to study the prorogation. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have some deep concerns, and I think the people of Saskatoon have deep concerns over the cost associated with this pandemic um, and some of the ethical lapses that this government has made, and that's what the essence of this motion is, is to study the procedural move of proroguing Parliament. This is our committee. We're a procedural committee. We should be studying the reasons for, and that's why 32 subset 7 will tell us or will direct us to do that study, and we're asking for a pre-study. I think Canadians would understand that. And I take offense that the Liberals now say that the cost is a consideration. We're over a trillion dollars in debt. What we are asking to study is a billion dollar program, or half a billion dollar program, that was also tied to why we prorogued. Everyone in Canada understands why we're pro we, we prorogued was so that the Liberals can hide from their scandals and waste. Right now, we're going to get the answers. We're going to get the answers either in the days coming in this pre-study or when it, um, the actual study takes place. So I would encourage the Liberals to stop stalling, and the sooner we get on with understanding why we were probed and the factors around that procedure in the PROC committee, which studies procedure, the better off I believe Parliament will be. And we can look at the arguments put forward by... of the meeting it is to continue to actually have uh, a meeting today on Ms. Vecchio's motion that's, we've been called on another motion uh, which has brought us here so we're disposing of that motion that's the 1064 motion once that is disposed of then we will move into consideration of Ms. Vecchio's um, Ms. Vecchio's motion and I would be I am prepared to to bring my ruling and then uh, we can proceed Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, just a point of order. Oh, yes, Mr. Doherty. Who put forth the motion to resume uh, to discuss whether we resume or not? Uh, you guys, my you under- guys did. My understanding was that was not a motion that we were putting for that that was put forward. It was that we were resuming the discussion on whether we were voting on this. This meeting has been scheduled and called under the 1064 motion, which has been signed by four members of the Conservative Party, um, and I believe it's the regular uh, standing members of this committee. So I. Uh, I think it's best we move to a vote to resume this meeting at this time. If most members are in favor of resuming this meeting, there should be no problem and we'll get on to the ruling. Todd, you got to know what your vote, what you're signing. Madam Chair, mm-hmm. I'll just make a comment here. Yes, um, Mr. Turnbull. It, my understanding is that a 1064 motion is debatable. Is that right? It is debatable, and that's why I allowed there to be debate on that motion. Perhaps I I, I should have made that clear. Um, this 1064 motion is the first time maybe many of us are uh, entertaining this motion, and so I have gone over it with uh, with procedural advice from the clerk as to how this process uh, would unfold, and so the appropriate steps to take would be to first uh, discuss or bring bring that motion. Uh, Well, we've come on that motion and then allow debate on that motion if the members choose to debate that motion. And then uh, at that point, um, there would be consideration of that request that has been made by the four members um, that have signed uh, the letter to bring this motion, to bring this committee today, uh, this meeting today. Uh, And then if that passes, we would resume to consideration of Ms. Vecchio's motion. At which okay. case you would start it, at which case you would start it off with your ruling. Yes, at which case I would start off with my ruling. I'm prepared Point to, of order. to do that. Yes, Mr. Doherty. Sure. Mr. Doherty. Mm-hmm. There was no motion in the letter. The purpose was to resume the debate on the motion that was mm-hmm. put forward. Am I is isn't that correct? Um Mr. Doherty, uh, we through that letter you invoked uh, Standing Order 1064, and so through that, that that is why we're in this procedural, uh, having to go through this procedural step. But um, Mr. Vave can definitely explain it to you if you think that um, it might clarify. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, essentially the way Standing Order 1064 works, um, upon receipt of a request from four members, a meeting is scheduled and. Today's meeting is that meeting that was scheduled. Essentially, the first order of business is to discuss whether or not the committee wants to, um, in this case, resume consideration of Ms. Vecchio's motion. Um, So that's essentially the first phase or the first step in the process. Uh, That's something that the committee has been doing um, for the past several minutes now. Uh, And without anybody else wanting to talk, it, one of the options open to the committee is to now move to a decision whether or not, in fact, they want to resume consideration of that motion. Um, so that's sort of the, the stage that we are at uh, right now. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Um, and since the recorded uh, vote was was requested, we can move to that recorded vote now. Can you have the, can you say the entire motion out though on what we are actually voting on specifically just so that we have it on record please so madam chair um the question would be shall the committee resume the consideration of miss vecchio's motion and i'll proceed now to the roll to the roll call of the members mr algabra yes miss duncan yes Mr. Gerritsen. Yes. Madam Pidgefaw Taylor. Yes. Mr. Turnbull. Yes. Mr. Doherty. Yes. Mr. Lakiski. Yes. Mr. Tucker. Yes. Ms. Vecchio. Yes. Monsieur Terrien. Yes. Yes. Miss Blaney. 
Well, I couldn't hear you, but I saw your lips moving and I vote yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, the, the motion to resume consideration of Ms. Vecchio's, um, Ms. Vecchio's motion is carried. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clerk. I know uh, <laughs> that was procedurally very formal, but now we are on to consideration of Ms. Uh, Vecchio's motion. And I know that, um, um, as I've stated in the House as well, I, I needed some time to, to review the motion because uh, I did find it to be a lengthy and, and complex one. Um, but I'd like to begin uh, by ruling on the motion moved by Ms. Vecchio at the meeting of September 28, 2020. The motion is quite long and detailed and I appreciate once again having the time to review it over the course of the past week. In assessing the motion's admissibility, my primary concern was to determine whether the motion falls within the mandate of this committee. Standing Order 108-1A states, Standing committees shall be severally empowered to examine and inquire into all such matters as may be referred to them by the House, to report from time to time, and except when the House otherwise orders, to send for persons, papers, and records. Beyond this, the specific mandate attributed to this committee can be found in Standing Order 104 and 108-3A. Among these responsibilities, Section 3 of Standing Order 108-3A includes the review of and report on the Standing Order's procedure and practice in the House and its committees. More relevant to this case, however, is Standing Order 32-7, which provides that the government document explaining reasons for prorogation be referred to this committee. The section reads, not later than 20 sitting days after the beginning of the second or subsequent session of a parliament, a minister of the crown shall lay upon the table a document outlining the reasons for the latest prorogation. This document shall be deemed referred to the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs immediately after it is presented in the House. This is a new standing order adopted in 2017. And this is the first time that it has been invoked. My assessment in this ruling is based on the application, the timeliness, and the relevance of these authorities to the motion of Ms. Vecchio. As I read it, the motion contains two distinct parts, two distinct separate parts. The first clearly relates to the prorogation, while the second is more focused on the inquiry of the WE charity and all its entities with relation to the Canada Student Grant. Also to be noted in paragraph O, which requires that all documents obtained through this motion be published on the committee's website. The supposed purpose of the motion is to prepare the committee for the review of the government's explanation for the prorogation of parliamentary session 43.1. Herein lies the first flaw of the motion. At first glance, one may be quick to draw parallels to the committee undertaking a pre-study on the matter. However, in this instance, even undertaking a pre-study at this time would be seen as being premature. When a pre-study of a bill is commenced in the House committee, in a House committee or a Senate committee for that matter, it is done once the bill has been given first reading in the House of Commons, but not yet reached the committee stage. This procedure allows the subject matter of the bill to be studied or referred to the House or Senate committee for general review, as opposed to a clause by clause study. In this instance, because the government has not yet tabled in the House a report outlining their reasons for prorogation, the committee is not in a position to have a base of reference from which to begin the study, nor would it be appropriate to presuppose the outcome of the report. Therefore, conducting a study on the matter through this motion is not timely. Furthermore, even if it could be argued that through the creation of Standing Order 32-7, this committee now has within its mandate 
the issue of prorogation and a subject matter study could be initiated before a response by the government is tabled in the House or prior to receiving an actual order of reference from the House, then the first part of the motion appear to be in line with this objective. It states that several ministers, including the Prime Minister, will be called to appear in orders that various government background document, it orders that various government background documents relating to the prorogation decision be turned over to the committee and that additional documents between the government and identified we charity entities and officers and MCAP in respect to the prorogation also be turned over to the committee. These documents are expected to be available to the committee by the time the government is required to table its justification for the prorogation towards the end of this month. Although I still find this motion to be premature at this time, I can agree with the basic proposition as articulated by several committee members that the automatic referral to the Standing Committee on Procedure and House Affairs referenced in Standing Order 32-7 places the government's stated reasons for prorogation within the mandate of the committee and that the committee is empowered to look into the government's reasons for prorogation. Paragraph A through D make a direct connection to the issue. In so far as that, as that link is made, the centrality of the prorogation reasons is respected. The witnesses and documents sought in these paragraphs are consistent with the effort to study reasons for prorogation. I have more difficulty in understanding the procedural connection of paragraphs E through N to possible reasons for the prorogation. Each paragraph, each paragraph orders, among other things, the production of papers, documents, and records from the government, including several ministers and the WE charity, its affiliate entities, and identified individuals. While the request for this material is an exercise of a committee's power under SO, uh, Understanding Order 108-1A, it is not clear to me that it is being applied in the pursuit of a procedurally acceptable mandate. This is an overreach. There is also the prospect of normally confidential unredacted cabinet documents obtained through this motion, including in paragraph E, that would be published on the committee's website. In a political context, Arguments and inferences can be made that a connection exists between the government's decision to prorogue and the WE charity issue. However, as chair, I must examine the matter strict, strictly in procedural context. In this case, the proposed course of study must be centrally linked to the committee's mandate, to the reasons why the session was prorogued. Paragraph E through N do not establish that essential link. Unlike the first part of the motion, there is no direct association to these paragraphs to prorogation. Instead, they are focused on the WE Charity and the Canada Student Service Grant. Consequently, I view these paragraphs as outside the committee's mandate and more in keeping with the mandate of the Standing Order Committee on Finance which was seized with these issues prior to prorogation. As such, I cannot find that this motion at this time and in its current form is in order, nor can I allow debate to continue on the motion. I would like to thank all honorable members for their attention to this matter. Madam okay. Speaker, with all due respect, I would like to appeal the decision and take it to the committee for a vote, please. Okay, uh, that is within uh, your right to do so. Um, Mr. Clerk, if you could help us with the process. Yes, and again, Chair. I know the clerk always does this, but if he could very clearly let us know what we are voting yes and no on. That would be great. Yes, I will. Um, the question before the committee now is, quote, shall the chair's ruling be sustained? Point of order. Um, 
clerk, is this to you? So to continue this cover up, we vote yes then? Clarification? I, I guess like you're uh, asked the point of order. that would be uh, difficult for the clerk uh, to answer in the way that question was framed. Uh, so you would vote yes in order to uh, sustain the ruling I have just given. And in order to overturn that ruling, you would vote no. Okay, is the committee ready for the question? Shall the chair's ruling be sustained? Mr. El Gabra. Yes. Ms. Duncan. Yes. Mr. Gerritsen. Mr. Gerritsen. Yes. Madame Petitpa Taylor. Yes. Mr. Turnbull. Yes. Mr. Doherty. No. Mr. Lakiski. No. Mr. Tucker. No. Ms. Vecchio. No. Mr. Ter Mr. Terrien. No. Ms. Blaney. Oh, I hear you now. Yes. Madam Chair, the ruling is sustained. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, what can happen at this point is uh, we can, upon consensus of the committee, uh, move into committee business if you wish, or uh, we could adjourn for the day. So, um, but in order to adjourn at this time, um, I, you know, I'd need consensus on that, I guess, at this point. Uh, but since we do have time, uh, within our regularly scheduled Madam time Chair. up to one, we could continue Madam. on committee business. Uh, Mr. Doherty. I move to adjourn. Okay. Uh, would you like a recorded vote then on that? Point of order, may I just ask for clarification from the clerk, specifically when there's no business on the agenda, what is the normal protocol? Just, just so that we know, thank you. Um, Madam Chair, to, um, to respond to Ms. Vecchio, um, there's no protocol per se. It really is up to the will of the committee to determine uh, what they would like to do, whether that is, in this case, adjourn or to move on to some other item of business such as committee business. A point of order. Yes, Madam Chair, I guess it's once again a point of clarification, so my apologies. One thing we haven't discussed, and I, I would not oppose Mr. Doherty's motion to adjourn, but before we adjourn, Madam Chair, I would like to know if you have plans for the timing of our next meeting. If we could finalize the timing and location of the next meeting, I would think that would be in the, certainly in the benefit for all committee members. Um, I, I don't have a, a scheduled meeting at this time. I think it may be up to the WIPs uh, to help us secure a next time. Uh, I do know that our regular slotted time for Thursday, there are many committees that are going to be uh, up and running on Thursday. So I would not want to um, you know, misspeak and, and say something at this time that maybe is not uh, accommodatable <laughs> or that, that can't be accommodated, I should say, uh, by the House staff and administration. So uh, at this time, I wouldn't be able to answer that clearly. But as soon as uh, we have our uh, time slot to have our next meeting, it will be scheduled and everyone will be notified. So just so I'm clear then, Madam Chair, you're suggesting that the WIPs will be informing committee members as to the timing of the next meeting? I think there will be some discussion uh, as to the timing of the next meeting, just like I open, um, I stated in my opening remarks, these hybrid committees uh, require a House administration team. Um, and we need to know if we have the resources uh, and ability to host uh, a meeting on a particular time and day, which I have not been informed yet of, uh, but I can discuss 
uh, that with the clerk, and then I think all the the party whip can can try to accommodate us. Hopefully the re the reason I ask uh, point, once again, thank order, you, Madam, Madam Chair. Point the reason order. the reason I ask. Um, just, just point of order. Moment, uh, yes, you're you're next on the list, Mr. Garrison. I'll there is a, a motion to adjourn on the table right now, Madam Chair. That's not debatable. I think we need to vote on that. It was moved by a Conservative member, so I think that we. You've given some latitude to answering some of Mr. Lukiski's Lu questions. I think I got it right that time, but I think we do need to vote on this now. Um, I, I would say that I don't feel that Mr. Lukiski is debating uh, adjournment at this time, but just asking some questions for clarification so, thus far. Um, perhaps and, I'll just. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. If, if I could ask one more, if I could possibly ask one more question for clarification. And Mark, you're right, uh, we will be voting on the adjournment motion, but my clarification is simply this in response to Madam Chair's um, statement that she has to consult with the House administration and, and to make sure that we, there's adequate resources for our next meeting. My understanding is that PROC is the only committee that meets at a regularly scheduled time, that being Tuesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. consistently, all other Committee meetings are adjusted in terms of their timing and location. PROC is the only one, again, to my, in my understanding, that remains constant. And that's why I wondered whether or not we would be having another meeting on Thursday at 11 a.m. Hybrid or in person doesn't really matter. But since that is a constant, I just tried to get clarification whether, in fact, we will meet on Thursday. Um. Unfortunately, my response to the question is going to be the same as I gave before. I'm just not aware at this time. I have to confer uh, with the clerk uh, and the team to to see if we can get back that that time slot uh, on this Thursday coming. So you will be informed as soon as possible about that. Um, okay, and let's resume to uh, the recorded vote on adjournment. The question is, shall the committee adjourn? Mr. Algabra. No. Ms. Duncan. No. Mr. Garretson. No. Madam Petipah Taylor. No. Mr. Turnbull. No. Mr. Doherty. Yes. Mr. Lukiski. Yes. Mr. Tucker. Yes. Ms. Vecchio. Yes. Monsieur Terry. Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry. Yes. Ms. Blaney. Yes. Okay. Motion to adjourn is carried. Okay, uh, so it looks like um, notice will go out for the next meeting and we should be um, meeting back on committee business uh, the next time we meet. Uh, and I call uh, this meeting for today adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm.